What a privilege to stand here and share some of my adventures. I'm just back, and what I'm going to start with is something I shot three weeks ago. So the beard was a bit longer, but that's where I've just come back from. Um, it was uh, just shy of 11,000 kilometers, 6,500 miles from Cairo to Cape Town. Uh, two days ago, I got the official uh, world record through in the post. Quite exciting. You've got to hold your breath and hope for the best and see that final verification coming through. Battling the heats of the Sahara Desert, the, the wet season, the incredible rains of Kenya and, and Ethiopia, some food poisoning along the way, some, a few issues with bike and body, but ultimately one of the toughest physical solo challenges I've taken on, and an incredible relief to come back and be able to share, share some of this for the, for the very first time. Now, going back a wee way, nine years ago I set out from this city with an economics and politics degree, and my plan at that point, without really thinking about it, was to have a career as an accountant in finance. Now, I was saying that, I was going through the process, but really my heart and soul was in the adventure world. I'd done so since the age of 12 when I pedaled across Scotland, 15 when I first soloed from the top of Scotland to the bottom of England. So I had these two paths going on, and I left uni and I got scared. I stopped, and I thought, what am I going to do at this point? So I set myself, I thought, if I've only got one chance to go big, I've got to go as big as possible, which has got to be the world. So an 18,000-mile journey became an 18,000-mile race. I never grew up wanting to be on telly, that wasn't my goal, but I simply needed to find some way to thank my sponsors for backing this huge ambition. So I filmed the whole journey for, for a documentary. And that was the start of what's happened since. Over the last nine years, I have uh, filmed a whole, a whole series of documentaries, written books, told the stories of not just cycling, but ocean rowing, mountaineering, Arctic expeditions. Now, yes, it's a living for me now. It's something I'm truly passionate about, but more than that, the feedback I get, and the reason I keep sharing the story in as many ways as I can is because even though I don't think people watch me cycling around the world and think, I'm going to cycle around the world, I know that it gives people the confidence to take on their own ideas. And confidence and making real choices is kind of what I want to focus on um, for, 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 for my time here because what I do is not rocket science. It's not cutting edge uh, you know, um, in, terms of, in terms of what we can do in, 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 in terms of studies, but I've taken my education and taken it in a, in a very different direction. I've applied myself physically and mentally, trying to figure out what my absolute personal best is and share the story in as big a way as I can. Now, when you take on a career like this, you face doubt all the time. Now, doubt and negativity doesn't just come from the press, from the public who you don't know. Pr uh, negativity, and the word impossible, comes from people who are close to you because they care about you. They worry about my livelihood, my safety, my well-being. And so when you're getting these big projects off the ground, I always say the hardest part is getting to the start line. You're normally good at what you say you're going to do, but it's actually that process. The far longer period of time it takes to get things off the ground. Most ideas don't get to the start line. And so let me redefine impossible in my terms, which is simply something which is well outside your comfort zone and something that maybe hasn't been done before. What a lot of what you do in your everyday life would be impossible to me. In the journey I've been on since the age of 12, the things I take on aren't impossible. And that comes to the next stage of quite clearly trying to set your own targets as, a tr as opposed to simulating others. You heard in the introduction the way I've broken these records by quite big margins. I'm not racing anyone else out there. For me, it's always about going as fast as humanly possible. I'm racing myself. I'm pushing myself as hard as I can and sharing the story in as big a way as I can. It brings me back to one of my favorite quotes of all time, and it really is something that I think about when I'm out there setting these targets for myself. We don't see the world really for how it is. We see the world for how we are, our experiences. It's impossible to remove our own bias, our own lifetime of experiences from our own decisions. But the hardest thing when you add up all our life experiences is to step back and truly make personal choices that make a difference and take us on a path which is, which is meaningful for us. Over the last decade, I've had the opportunity to travel to 120 countries. And the more you travel, the more you see similarities as opposed to differences. We read about the world in the press and we divide it into differences. You travel and you realize that people are motivated by the same things, have the same insecurities, have the same you know, loves and hates and passions. And, and it's, 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 it's very empowering to see that because you come back home and first of all, realize what an incredible uh, freedom of choice that we have. And also, the scary part is you know, whether we actually 
you know, truly make the most of that or not. So I'll share a few highs and lows, and I'd say most importantly, the, the, the raison d'etre, the, the reason that I've got the passion to keep going back out there, not because I expect you to row oceans or go through the Arctic, but hopefully because it gives you some ideas. And I'm truly passionate about trying to help young people who have got great educations then take personal choices as opposed to sort of getting caught up in careers which maybe they don't have that fire in the belly for. This is where it started, an 18,000 mile race around the world. It doesn't look too bad on that scale of a map, does it? 18,000 miles. You're solo, you're unsupported, it's up to you to get around the globe as fast as possible. I was going 100 miles a day for half a year. The great thing about human-powered journeys of any description is you see the world, even though you're pushing yourself as hard as you can, you see the world in incredible detail. There's nobody with you to distract you, and there's no windows up in a car, so your senses are completely tuned in. And you need the world around you to get through safely. I always say expeditions are incredibly tough but simple. You need food, you need hydration, you need a safe place to sleep each night, each night, and you need to do the hours. You need to actually put that time in to get through and hit your targets. It's as simple as those four things. The big dream, the targets, the world records will take care of themselves if you can get absolutely obsessed with what you can affect each day your food, your hydration, your sleep pattern, and uh, the time on the bike. So this is me racing through the Punjab, out of Pakistan into India. Um, the finish was, was quite incredible, because when I left, this story was covered by my local paper, the Dundee Courier, if you know it. When I, when I finished, it was a national front page story. It became a big documentary, and there was really quite a, quite, a, quite, a, quite a media bubble I was thrown into. And then I suddenly realized by sharing these stories, there'd be an opportunity to go back out and take on, take on quite a number of others. People watch these things, tune into the telly, because I think they love the idea of doing them. I always argue, I don't think people would actually enjoy some of the realities. I've done four expeditions, which are over half a year. I've just raced through Africa at the pace of 160 miles a day. There's a lot of pain, a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort, a huge amount of time in your own head. But of course, there's great pleasure, and you sort of, you sort of forget about all those, those, those toughest times. And uh, you know, for some reason, you pick yourself up and motivate yourself to go back. It's the reason I could really never do the same journey twice, because you know too much, having done it. Um, so this was, this was where I went next, the length of the Americas, 13,000 miles by bike, down the length of the Rockies and the Andes, taking on some of the high peaks. I'll just take you to the mountains. As a, a point of difference on this expedition, that is three weeks living in the freezer to climb the highest mountain in North America, Denali. You're roped to a team to get through safely. So um, an incredibly beautiful but difficult place to exist. Everyone defines your success on the mountains as to whether you stood on the top or not. And trust me, when you climb a mountain, I've yet to stand on the top and see anything, which is what you dream of, and feel very good because you're at high altitude, you feel rubbish, and you're halfway there, you're a long way from safety. And so what other people define your success by and what you personally remember most fondly about these journeys, I think mountains are the ultimate metaphor for what it's like for you to do it and for other people to define your success or not. I then headed into the oceans for a number of years. This was uh, in preparation to try and take a rowing boat further north than had ever been before, 800 miles north of the Arctic Circle. This, before you shout out, is not the Arctic. This is the English Channel, but it's a picture of the boat. It's a 1.3-ton ocean rowing boat. It's got a flat keel underneath, so we can push and pull it when we hit the, the ice fields. Don't stand on the dark blue bit. You're in a team here. You're entirely reliant on your, your friends around you to get through, making very difficult decisions because you're beyond rescue. People often ask, do you ever consider giving up, quitting, when it gets too difficult? The simple answer is, you don't have that luxury. You don't have that choice four miles to our final destination, the 96 Magnetic North Pole, and uh, we did not expect to be doing this. We were going through lots, around lots of ice fields all yesterday, through the night, and then this morning, and then we got stuck in this last one. It closed in behind us, and, um, well, we're hoping we can pull it through in these little leads and across the, the ice, but it's incredibly slow going. Nobody's slept for a day and a half now, but uh, at least the weather's great. Stick to the positives. Um, just a, an incredible landscape to find yourself in. And the, the film that we made about that was about really capturing a first moment that a journey like this would be possible, showing how the world is, is changing. So a real bittersweet in the success of we, what we set out to do. They're not all successes. I've sort of picked a few of the, the highs and the lows here. This is going for the mid-Atlantic world record. Another triple skull ocean rowing boat, Tarfea, Morocco. 
and we're going to try, going to try and race to, the, to, to Barbados as fast as possible. Trying to go sub 30 days. You're going two hours on, two hours off, two hours on, two hours off for a month, never sleeping for more than 90 minutes. It's torture. Um, day 28, a huge wave picked us up, barrel rolled as we capsized, right on a change of shift. The stern cabin flooded, and we went from fighting for the record to fighting for our lives. I spent 14 hours in the water. 14 hours not knowing if we'd be rescued. There we are, one o'clock in the morning when a Taiwanese cargo vessel eventually found us and pulled us out of there. At the time, one of the most traumatic and difficult situations of my life. Very, very nearly didn't come back. Truly and honestly, the one I learned the most for, not in terms of the fact that any part of it was a success, but simply because in terms of life direction and what I enjoy, this was pivotal. I always thought it was about pushing myself physically and mentally, figuring out what I was capable of, and that was it. What I discovered very clearly in the Atlantic was, actually, it was the world around me. It was that interaction on a journey, as well as you try and plan it, just not knowing what's around the corner and how each day is different. That's the exciting part. Any career, any job needs to have that interaction with the world around you. Otherwise, you go crazy. People ask about boredom, loneliness on expeditions. On all of my solo expeditions, I've never been there in the Atlantic, in a team. I found it incredibly empty and incredibly lonely. And that's before the capsize happened. So incredibly important to sort of push myself there and then have, the, have that sort of moment of realization, thinking that this is not why I do it. Do it. This is not why I do adventure. And this peer pressure and this television pressure saying, go back out there and do something bigger and more dangerous. And I had to come back and say, I, I don't enjoy it. Rule number one, if you don't enjoy it, don't do it. So my passion, my, my plan to go on and do the Pacific, the Indian after this, I drew a line under. And I took a number of years to figure out what's next. There we go. People ask me, is it difficult to climb a, a nine meter rope ladder in the middle of the night in high seas? That's one of the easiest things I've ever done. I scampered up that, <laughs> no problem at all. Which brings me back nicely to, to, to where I've just come from, racing down Africa as fast as I can, pushing myself to my limits and trying to share the story in as big a way as possible. Now, having shared these stories over the last uh, 10, 15 minutes, it's not with the expectation that any of you will want to go and do anything similar. But coming back to the sort of the big question of the day, which is about why not here, for me, that really is not a conversation about anything geographic, infrastructure, education. For me, why not here is, is really about the personal question, personal identity, and, and finding contentment, finding a reason to, 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 to really sort of push your limits. I really genuinely think that, that it's your talents, your network, and uh, your passion that's, that's the best starting place for all this. Um, one of my greatest concerns with education as we have it, whilst it works for, for, for many, is that you can easily, can easily get swept away in something which is, which is not right for you. And what, te what you tend to see is, I talked before about comfort zones, pushing your comfort zones. When you push yourself through to your maybe early 20s, that's a good time leaving higher education to risk big, try these things. Because you tend to find, and it's a, it's a grand generalization, that after that point, you play it safe and your comfort zone will retreat unless you get into a habit of scaring yourself, pushing yourself, and, and really working at something that you're personally passionate about. There's a real temptation, isn't there, to play it safe for changes you'll make at some point in the future. And the thing which I'm most passionate about outside sharing these stories is working with young people to take the great freedom of choice that we all have growing up in this part of the world and the education which so many of us benefit from and then have real pause points in our life and making sure that the decisions we then make are ones that we're contented with because ultimately that's what's going to benefit ourselves, our friends, our family, our peers, our community, our country in the long run. And uh, it's a funny balance, isn't it? Because so much focus is putting, put into what happens when people fall out the education system. Well, I've got equal concern for those that excel brilliantly and I want them all to be given the space and time to think and choose something which is truly important for them it's a great challenge for society. If we look back over history, it's only something which has happened in the last 50, 60 years. So I think it's a really important time, whether we're a parent or whether we're going through education ourselves, to give ourselves and those who are close to us the freedom of time to really make those, uh, those choices so that they've got uh, something which they're, they're truly proud of and passionate about. You know, the world we live in, the economy of scales works brilliantly for products. My concern is you can't use the economies of scale for people. You need to Strip it back to, to, to what we're each individually passionate about. For me, 
it's endurance. It's exploring the world and it's sharing it in as big a way as possible. And my final thought is, if you, whatever your passion is, can share that in as big a way as you can, you never know who else you'll give the confidence to take on what they're passionate about. Thank you.